Okay, do you remember the uh, last time that you moved house? Do you remember the last time that you, you moved? I think it's commonly said, isn't it, that along with starting a new job and along with getting married, that moving house can be one of the more stressful things that a person can do. That's right, isn't it? I'm sure of us could affirm that. But whether it is uh, to accommodate a growing family or whether it is that we are moving somewhere to begin a new job someplace else, or maybe because we are downsizing and because the children may have moved on, usually we move house for a very good reason, don't we? We don't just do that in a whim. We move house because it's part of a plan. Well, this morning, believe it or not, what we're going to do in our time together is you and I are going to watch Removal Men at work, aren't we? In Genesis chapter 46, what happens? But Jacob and his family, they pack up all their belongings. They get those, all those cardboard boxes filled and they move everything and they move it down to Egypt. And what is actually going to become clear pretty quickly in this portion of Scripture is that these people too, that they move for a reason. So this move that we're going to follow from Canaan all the way down south, this is a move that is part of a plan. No, it's part of the plan. No, it is part of the redemptive plan of Almighty God. Okay. So if you've got a Bible with you, wonderful. You can uh, turn there to Genesis 46. If you don't, don't panic. We will uh, put some of the verses of this uh, portion of Scripture up on screen. Uh, uh, The first thing that I think we ought to pay very close attention to here, number one, would be what you and I learn in this chapter about our God. That's the first area of our focus, the primary area of our focus. What do we learn in Genesis 46 about God? our God, the God that we worship. Okay, so let's begin there. Now, um, were you here last week at church? If you were present last Sunday morning, I think you'll probably stand with me when I say that the chapter that we dealt with last week was one of those kind of sections that gets right into our bones. It's a portion of scripture that really sticks with us. Do you remember it? That was a beautiful portrait of reconciliation, wasn't it? And forgiveness. As at long, long last, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers and they all had that family hug. They they had that warm, tender embrace. You remember it? If If you were here, perhaps you'll also remember the mission that the brothers were immediately called to. Surely that rings a bell, does it? that as soon as there was reconciliation, the brothers were given this task, that they were to almost head up to Canaan, weren't they, and to bring who? The family? Yes. But perhaps you remember that all of the focus really was on Jacob. So they were to move immediately up to Canaan to make sure that their father, they got their father, and they brought him down to live with Joseph in Egypt. That was the mission. That was the task. Now, uh, uh, for starters, I would ask you this morning just to try and imagine what that prospect was like for Jacob himself. Okay? Think about it from Jacob's point of view just for a moment. Not to put too fine a point in it. Jacob's an old man. Now, Jacob is a very elderly bloke at this point in time. You might have noticed at the end of chapter 45, he's talking about his impending death. And what does this move mean? Packing up everything. What does it mean? It means change. It means change for an older man. He has to pack up everything. He has to pack up even his memories, pack up his family, pack up all of his belongings. Now, wait a second, though. To where does he have to travel? Egypt. To this place that is synonymous, really, with what? Idolatry, right? Sin? Like, is this not an incredibly intimidating prospect for this man? Don't you think? No wonder 
No wonder we've just read God say to him, do not, Jacob, do not fear. Now, maybe it is already this morning at St. Peter's right now uh, that you have felt suddenly the relevance to your own life of this particular portion of Scripture. Not looking at anyone in particular, of course, but perhaps it is that you're feeling your age at the moment. Perhaps that even this morning, the aches and the pains involved with just getting here and getting to church. Or perhaps that's not it. Perhaps it is that you are faced with dramatic change in your circumstances at this point in your life. Maybe it is even that you are today, this morning, fearing as you stand the, the, the next chapter of your life. Maybe you feel the weight of the relevance of this. So, okay. What happens here? Well, actually, I think it's very crucial to notice this, straight off the bat, to notice that what Jacob does is he seeks out God. Now, did everyone get, at the beginning of the chapter, the geographical reference that's repeated? Do you see it? Maybe. See, in, in verse 1, we're told that he goes to Beersheba. Does that, should that mean anything to us? Absolutely it should. Get this. This is the place where not only his dad, Isaac, and his grandfather, Abraham, Beersheba was the place where God had very specifically revealed truth to these men. So do you see what Jacob's doing? He's traveling there as quickly as he can to seek out the will of God. Now that, that's interesting. That's startling for us. He goes immediately to seek out God. But actually what is more important, I think, surely you would agree, is what God says to him. So let's work through it together. Uh, let's try and put this up on the screen. Let's see if our technology works for us. It does work for us. You've got verses 2 to 4 in front of us. This is what God is saying to Jacob. So what do you see? What do you see? Yes, you notice, I think everyone's got it, that he repeats Jacob's name. As God so often does, at times of crisis through the Bible. Can you think of any instances of that? Saul, Saul, very persecuting me. Abraham, Abraham, Samuel, Sam. So you've got, again, point of crisis, God's coming. Jacob, Jacob. But what I really want you this morning to linger on for your own walk with Christ is to notice how here, God almost, if you'll allow this phrase, God almost goes out of his way to comfort this man at this point of crisis and, 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 and worry. Okay, indeed, this is what I want you to do. I'll ask you a favor. I want you to look at this, and I want you to chart, walk along through this with me as I highlight some elements of the comfort that God gives to this man who is intimidated and fearful. You'll do that, will you? Look at it with me. Okay, what do we see? First of all, do you see a reminder of God's identity? How does God start? Do you notice? Jacob, Jacob. And then he says, I am God. I am what? The, the God of your father. Can you not imagine, as a believer sitting here, can you not imagine the comfort that that brings to, to Jacob at this point of worry about the future? Like he is reminded that this God who has covenanted, committed to him, not only is he the God who is sovereign over everything that is going to happen to him in Egypt, but he is also, this God is also the God with a perfect track record of care. Perfect track record of comfort. The God who has done well and done all things right to those who have gone before. I am God, but I am also the God of your Father. The comfort in that. Second, I want you to follow along with me. Also notice the approval God gives to this trip. I'm just going to pause for a moment here because um, there, is a, there is, I think, a really important further aspect to the uh, trepidation or to the fear or the worry that Jacob must have had about going to Egypt. I reckon some of you in here right now are already miles ahead of me on this. But allow me to catch up with you at this point. Where is he going? 
He's going to Egypt. I want you to think about that in terms of this book of Genesis. Now, is this not, am I not right in saying that both Jacob's dad and his grandfather both had sinful, negative experiences when it came to the land of Egypt? Think about it from Jacob's perspective. What about his grandfather, Abraham? Can, can you remember? Was Egypt not the place where Abraham pretended that his wife, Sarah, was his sister? Remember, with all the chaos that that brought? And then what about his dad? What happened with Isaac? Do we remember? Do we not remember that God expressly prohibited Isaac from going down to Egypt? Do not go down to Egypt. Did you see it? From Jacob's perspective, he's sitting scratching his head thinking, well, I'm supposed to pick up all of my family, all of my stuff, and I'm supposed to go where? To Egypt? No wonder he wants to run this past God. And so can you not feel the weight come off his shoulders and the reassurance with the next phrase? Do you see what God says? I am God, I'm God. And then he says, to, to, do not be afraid to go there. Do you see God is laying on the, the approval for this journey? Do not be afraid. Then third, if you're following along, don't you also notice the insurance of a divine purpose? Maybe you can see it in verse three, can you? If you've got it in your, in your hands or on the screen. God then assures, I'm what? Comfort. God assures Jacob that though he will have to leave and go down to Egypt, this is part of this grand divine plan. Do you notice what he says? God says, it will be in Egypt. It will be there that I will prosper you. It will be there in amongst all of the sin and idolatry that I will grow you and your people. Imagine the comfort for this elderly man as he looks to his family. Four, there's only five, so you can stick with me. Four, do you notice that God assures Jacob of glory in the end for this man? Look about halfway through verse four. Look at it. He assures Jacob that though he is descending to Egypt, one day it will be different, he says to this elderly man. One day I will take you out of that place. One day you will be back in the land of promise. And there's this beautiful element where your beloved son will close your eyes in death. And if you've followed it all, and you've had your caffeine this morning, perhaps you're looking at me and think, Abbott, he's missed one. <laughs> Perhaps you're looking thinking, the ministers missed the most important element. Because what happens? What does God do at the beginning of verse 4? Do you notice what he does? He assures this elderly man of his ongoing presence. Listen to the words from the Almighty God. He says to him, I myself am going to go with you down Egypt. I'm going to go with you. Can you imagine that from Jacob's perspective? To know that the, that the special favor of Almighty God is going to go with him. That God himself is going to travel with him. Surely, if you are a believer in this room, you agree. That's the greatest comfort he could possibly hear. And so I ask you again this morning, is it you? Is it you that God is speaking to? Are you faced with an intimidating future just now? As you sit in here in St. Peter's, you worried about the next chapter of your life as you sit there today, then do you not see a wonderful truth in this chapter of Scripture that if we take these things to God and if he assures us that the next direction we want to take is his will, what do we know? We can know two things. One, that God will be with us. And two, that God will use this next chapter of our lives and he will use it for the glory of his great name. We learn about our God, the God of all comfort. Second thing, though, in Genesis 46, we learn about our church. Boy, do we need that. We learn about our church. Uh, a few years ago now, I'm rubbish with dates. I'm going to say five or six years ago, uh, I found myself sitting in a doctor's office in, um, in London, and uh, though it turned out nothing particularly serious, um, I'm sitting there, going in for tests. You've all been there, right? 
And I'm sitting in the doctor's office, sitting across the desk from the doctor. Um, I'm rubbish in these circumstances as well. And uh, I was a bit bemused by the approach that the doctor was taking with me um, because he started by asking about my family history. So I'm sitting there thinking, this is a bit of a tangent, isn't it, to start with? And he started asking about my mum and my dad. And he started about asking about my aunt and my uncle and, you know, extended family. Um, and the medics in here can speak to me afterwards about whether this is a conventional approach or not. Uh, but asking about their sort of medical history. But even if it's unconventional, I'm pretty sure that we can all work out what he was doing. We can learn an awful lot about ourselves, can't we? If we know information about those who have come before us, especially when it comes to genetics and health, we can learn an awful lot about what, what we might face, strengths, weaknesses, by knowing about our family history. And we need at St. Peter's this morning to appreciate that's true in Genesis 46. Who are these people? It's a long list of people. Who are they? You have to consider that these people here are your spiritual forefathers. That's who these people are. This is your family tree. And this morning, by God's grace, as we just pick away at it, we are pointed to truths that help us as Christians, help us as a church. Indeed, I want to just draw your attention to three aspects that are very important for St. Peter's here. First, you are pointed here to our identity as a church. Can, can I, can I uh, turn this over to you, actually? This is a, a, partly a device to keep everybody awake. Uh, but can I turn this over to you for a second? So we dealt with the first section, have we? So this is Jacob encountering God. If you take the whole section that Will read kindly for us, the whole section, the list of names... What would you say, what aspect of these people's identity is being brought to the fore? Can I give you just a second to chew, chew on that for a moment? So if you take the whole of the section that's been read, what aspect of these people's identity is being highlighted? Well, I wonder what you would say. Don't shout any, out any answers because then I'll just be flustered. What aspect of their identity? I think... You could come back at me with two legitimate answers. I wonder if you've got them. One, you could say it is their identity as a family that has been highlighted in Genesis chapter 46. That's true. Everyone can see that, can you? I mean, think about it. Jacob, I don't know how many times he's called the father of these people, and then it's all about the sons. They're not just named, but it's the sons. It's the children. It's the wife. It's this list of names is like a list of descendants, isn't it? It's like you're going online and researching your, your, your genealogy, and it's this family tree appears before you. Do we not agree? Highlighted here, a family. What I want you to appreciate that that is not the primary emphasis here in Genesis chapter 46. Now listen carefully. The primary emphasis here is on the nationhood of this group of people. These people as a nation. Because I wasn't quite accurate when I was talking about verse 3. Do you notice? God does not just say, in Egypt, I will prosper you doesn't say, in Egypt, I will grow you. What does he say? He says, specifically in Egypt, you will become a great nation. Now, this is the next bit. If we could look at verse 5, and if I could have everyone's attention, look at verse 5. Now, let me draw your attention to a phrase that everyone is really familiar with. Now, do you see the expression, the sons of Israel? You see there? It depends maybe what translation of the Bible you've got. Some of you might have children of Israel. Have you got that? So we all know that expression. I think it is about 700 times that that uh, uh, expression is used in the Old Testament. If you don't believe me, you've got a task for the afternoon. You can go and, and uh, count them if you want to. But you hear sons of Israel, sons of Israel, about 680 to 700 times in the Old Testament. So why highlight it here? Listen, this is most likely, it would seem, the very first time in the Bible that this is used technically to speak of the people as a nation. 
The very, it's been used before, but this is the very first time you hear children of Israel or the sons of Israel, the first time that it's used in that technical way to describe the people as a people, to describe them as a nation. And is this not incredibly important for us here in St. Peter's? Because I want to ask you, like, what are we in here? Are we really just a group of individuals who stumble out of bed and, and just come in here and just happen to be in the same place at the same time on a Sunday to worship God? Is that how we're thinking of each other? Is that what this is? No, you, you want to say we're a family. Oh, do we not need to embrace that? Do we not need to start living that out? We are a family. We are called to love each other, be patient with each other. We are a family, but, but it's more than that as well, isn't it? Because, Christian friends, we at St. Peter's are part genuinely of a spiritual nation. We are part of a spiritual people. I do not care if you want to be patriotic about Britain. I couldn't care less. Don't even care if you want to be patriotic about being Scottish. What I do care about is that you understand if you're a Christian that in reality there's something so much better than that. There's something so much grander than that. The Apostle Peter says to you what? He says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation with Christ Jesus as our monarch. Christ is our king. So we're pointed to Genesis 46, nationhood. We are part of a people. Another direction we're pointed is to our expansion as a people. I feel like apologizing to Will uh, this morning. You probably know where I'm going. Sorry to embarrass you for a moment here, but what a cruel thing to do. Don't you agree? You know, working through Genesis 46 and we get all of these names and to pass the buck to somebody else. So this is a, a, an official public apology to you. I'm sure you will forgive me. But we do ask, don't we? Why bother? Why here does God insist that every one of these names is recorded? Why doesn't it say, we went up to get Jacob, and Jacob and his family moved south to Egypt? In a sense, we may be worse that it did say that. But it doesn't say that, does it? Every name is listed. Why at this point? And then we can add to the, the confusion and the dilemma, can't we? Because we could also say, why bother with the numbers? Now, did you notice that? If not, just you can have a, a gander. Look at verse 40, uh, 26 and 27. Have a look there. Like, do you see it? There's already been numbers mentioned. There's 33 of these people and so on. Now it's there's 66 of these people and then it all comes to... Why? Why these names like this? Why these numbers like this? I wonder, Christian friend, if you see an answer to that. It is this morning as though the Bible is screaming to us at St. Peter's. This is all there were. Moses, writing to a people later on who will read this, down in the dumps perhaps. Moses saying, remember what God has done. Look at how few people came into Egypt. Though there were millions who would come out of Egypt eventually in the Exodus, there were only 70 people in entirety that went in. Consider what God has done. And isn't that a challenge and maybe even a rebuke to some, some of us in here? What is the tone so much in, in the Scottish church? Is it not that we are down in the dumps a lot of the time? Isn't that the case, that we are kind of frustrated about how very little is taking place and how few people are coming to faith? And, and, and there's an element of legitimate frustration. But this morning, consider what God is doing from 70 today. Look around the world. From 70, God is 
building his nation. He's building his church. God is in action. We should be so encouraged. The fact that there, is, there are people today in Dundee, there are people in this city who in due course are going to hear about Jesus. And by a work of the Holy Spirit, these people are going to be engrafted in. They're going to be taken into the family of God. They will become part of this people. God is at work. And then the last aspect, we see our identity. We see something of this expansion. But we also see something of our trials here and our difficulties. Um, Can you imagine Jacob for a moment? He's encountered God. Imagine him, please. And he has heard that the people will grow, that this covenant promise to Abraham of a great nation, it will be fulfilled in Egypt. Am I not right in saying that Jacob is right to have a question? Could he not ask, God, why can't you just do that here? Is there not a sense in which we ask that question? God, you're going to build these people. You're going to make us a great nation. Why do we have to be taken into Egypt for that to happen? Why do we have to take up all of our family, all of our possessions, our whole lives and journey? Why can't you bring Joseph up here? Why do we all have to go to Egypt? Now listen carefully, please. Part of the answer is about purity. Now, if we look at verse 10, There's a hint for you here. Now look at verse 10. It looks like we just pass it over, but what are you told? Do you notice that the sons are beginning to stray in Canaan? Do you notice that they are beginning to intermarry, to stray away from God's purposes? So what does God do? Oh, it's ingenious. What does God do? He takes them to Egypt A place where, because Egyptians hated shepherds, they did. So God takes them to Egypt, a place where the Egyptians, because they hated shepherds, the people of Israel are going to be left alone for a time. A place where they can remain pure. Part of the answer here is about the purity of the people of God, but more. Now listen carefully again. This is about oppression. This is about opposition. You know your Bible well enough to know this. Even the younger people in here, you know what happens in Egypt. What happens? Slavery. Mistreatment. Do you not see? Why does God bring his people to Egypt? Because as it is so often, it is through adversity that God grows and expands his people And yes, this morning in here, as an individual, as a Christian, you might not know what the next chapter of your life holds. This is for sure. None of us know what the next chapter of the church in Scotland holds. But what can we be sure about? Regardless of the opposition that comes, regardless of the oppression that might come, God is going to build his people. God is going to build his church and not even... The gates of hell can prevail against it. So we see something of our God. We see something um, of our church. And then much more briefly, believe me, we should see what we learn here about our Savior, our Savior. Just to close, just to end, do we know what's meant by covenant theology? Do we know what's meant by covenant theology? This is a time of year where people are scratching their heads trying to think about... um, what they'll read for their summer, summer reading, okay? (laughs) This is a a bold proposition from the minister, but instead of the novel, maybe we can read uh, to find out more about covenant theology. What is covenant theology? Listen, it's not as grand as it sounds. Some of these terms are so off-putting. Covenant theology is quite simply a framework for understanding the message of the Bible. So it comes out of our tradition as Protestant Christians, comes out of the Reformation. It's just a framework to help us to understand the message of the Bible by looking and thinking about the covenants in the Bible. It's God-given. Now, in a word, there's three covenants. You're going to stick with me, honestly. 
The, the rule is do this at the beginning of the sermon so people are there with you. Never leave this stuff to the end and I'm breaking all the rules. But you'll stick with me. Three covenants, okay? Three main covenants. First, the covenant of works. We've definitely heard of this, the covenant of works. Haven't we? What's this? This is the agreement, the divine agreement that God makes with Adam in the garden. Now, what is the covenant? What is the agreement? God promises from his part, he will bestow life on Adam in exchange for what? In exchange for obedience. That's it. It's the covenant of works. Isn't it? So God says to Adam in the garden, you will have life if you just obey me. Beautiful agreement. But what happens? We know the answer, don't we? Adam breaks his part of the bargain. He breaks the covenant. Oh, wait. Second covenant. Uh, the covenant of grace. Because what does God do immediately after the garden? Isn't it an amazing thing to consider that God immediately reveals a new way? And what is this agreement just after the garden? That God will bestow life, you say? God will bestow ever, listen to the good news, God will bestow everlasting life on humanity in exchange for, not works, not obedience, just faith. Isn't that amazing? I will give you everlasting life if you will just believe in the Savior that is to come. And, and as Scripture progresses from Genesis 3 onwards, that covenant of grace is unfolded gradually by way of other covenants until what? Until the last unfolding, the new covenant. And what do we learn? That that Savior has come. That Savior is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. He is the one in whom we must believe. Covenant of works. Covenant of grace. Ah, what did I say? Three covenants. Is this where I want your attention as we close? Because if you and I went back before the foundation of the world, if we went back to a place where there was no time nor light, we would find a third covenant, the covenant of redemption. And this was not a covenant that God made with man. Now listen carefully. This was an agreement between the three persons of the Godhead themselves. Are you hearing that? A covenant between Father and Son and Holy Spirit. A covenant where it was agreed that they would send the Son into this world that was about to be created. And at St. Peter's this morning, in Genesis chapter 46, are we not given just a lovely little snapshot and a little illustration of this glorious pre-temporal agreement? You consider what we read. Jacob, who is he? He is the covenant representative. Who is he? He is the federal head of his family. And what is his task? Do you see? His task is to leave the promised land. His task is to leave the dwelling place of God. What is his task? He is to descend to where? To the place of sin. He's to descend to the place of idolatry. What is his task? His task is to see a people, a nation grow up through him. And yes, Yes, it is that covenant representative's obedience that is highlighted in this text. He must have seen it. As it is with Jesus Christ in perfect obedience, so it's Jacob's full obedience to God's will that is highlighted. But I want to end with this. I'm going to ask you, what is the grounds, the foundation, the basis for all of this plan? Did you notice? Put up verse 1. We close with verse 1. What would you say? What's the first thing he does? What's the grounds for it all? You say, go to Beersheba. What is the grounds? Do you see? The grounds for it all is sacrifice. Jacob knows there can be no communion with God. There can be no direction from God. There can be no relationship with God. There can be no people brought up before God unless sin is dealt with unless sin 
is atoned for. And so, St. Peter's, as we go to the table just now, is that not a fitting place for us to close? Are you a Christian? How grateful you should be that God loves you so much that before the foundation of the world, he has planned for you to be saved and redeemed. And how grateful you should be this morning that though your salvation would cost the blood, the lifeblood of his only beloved son, how grateful we all should be. Out of love, God has borne that cost for you. Friends, let's bow our heads and let's pray.